Sophie Holder, Executive Officer at De Montford University, and I have the pleasure of welcoming you to another talk in our anti-racism series. Now, as you may or may not know, the anti-racism series is a year-long set of lectures and presentations that focus on issues of race as they relate to different fields in academia and beyond, as well as ways to oppose and counter racial prejudice and systemic racism. Now, today's title is Race and Sport, which has been in the work for many months. The reason why this particular topic is part of the series is not so much because of newly arising issues of race and racism in sport, but instead to further highlight, address and understand issues that have long been present but seem to only recently be gaining public attention. Now to present on this topic today, we have a very exciting roster of academic experts who will be giving speed lectures that focus on their different areas of sports research, ranging from boxing, football and cricket to FIFA for gaming and mental health in professional sports. Now our speakers are, and bear with me because they are some very busy men, our author and historian Dr Duncan Stone, director of the Leicester Institute for Inclusivity in Higher Education and lecturer at the University of Leicester, Dr Paul Ian Campbell, author and professor of European history at the Montford University, Professor Pankios Panayi, author, co-founder of the annual Sport and Discrimination Conference Series and senior lecturer at Leeds Beckett University, Dr. Dan Kilvington, lecturer in health and wellbeing science at De Montford University, Dr. Chris Elsie and his team, and last but not least, author and associate professor of modern history at De Montford University, Dr. David D. I do want to let you know that there will be a questions and answers section at the end of the lecture, so please write down all of your questions in the chat box as we will try and get through as many as possible, but I will not delay you any longer. Our speakers will follow on directly from each other, so please let me welcome once again our first speaker, Dr Duncan Stone, in his lecture, Race, Class and Cricket. Thanks very much, Sophie. Afternoon, everyone. Uh, although we there have been thousands of books published on the game. Very few have ever questioned the elitist monoculture that defines English cricket's historical orthodoxy. As an institution, therefore, cricket has had an easy ride because it has always been examined from the top down rather than the bottom up. As a history from below, my new book reveals the extent that the upper and middle classes of this country, uh, and I'm not putting this too lightly, detest meritocracy and how their fear of equality not only shaped the development of first class cricket, but also the recreational game in the southeast of England, where socially open meritocratic competitions in the form of cups and leagues were effectively banned until the late 1960s. Although cups and leagues are now pay, played nationwide, the evidence strongly suggests the game's structural and cultural development hinged upon the preservation of class structures. Indeed, we should not be surprised that cricket is regarded as a posh sport because it has never 
been run in the interests of the general public. This process may be broken down into two distinct eras, that of the gentleman amateur, the late Victorian and Edwardian period, and an era which began with the creation of the ECB in 1996. From this point onwards, the ECB replaced the inherently anti-capitalist tenets of amateurism with overt commercialism. Despite this fundamental ideological shift, the men in charge of each era ensured cricket became less popular. While this was a deliberate ploy of the gentlemen amateurs, the ECB disenfranchised ordinary supporters further, some four million of them in just four years, after they abandoned broadcasting rights to the mercy of the free market. If we want British society and individual institutions such as cricket to be more inclusive, or at the very least less racist, understanding their structural and cultural development is essential. I believe sport provides valuable lessons, for it is here, in a context seemingly predicated upon fair play or a level, level playing field, that the elites of this country have shown their true colours. As we do not have the time to cover this in any detail today, I will focus upon the reasons why racism appears to have increased or, alternatively, why the propensity of multiracial sport has declined. Racism has, of course, been a significant feature of life in this country for many years, with the post-war period in particular being marked by wide-ranging colour bars and, most famously, Enoch Powell's Rivers of Blood speech. In cricket, this racism was exemplified by the Dolivera affair, which witnessed the MCC, who then ran cricket in England, to collude with the racist South African government. And yet it appears racism has intensified over the last 40 years, following the implementation of neoliberal policies that have gradually hollowed out the pillars that enabled working class people to participate in civil society. Thus, as badly as the ECB has run cricket, the elitism that the elitism that this body has encouraged has been exacerbated by a fundamental shift in the political climate. Moreover, the implementation of Thatcherite policies since 1979 has initiated a steep decline in cricket participation. If the deindustrialization formed part of a broader attack on working class institutions and culture, the government's targeting of nationalised industries such as coal with strong trade unions or utilities such as British Telecom deemed ripe for privatisation led to hundreds, perhaps thousands of workplace sports facilities being sold off as valuable yet unprofitable assets. If the loss of these grounds provided an early indication of the hollowing out of civil society to come, the demise of workplace sport was doubly significant because it ended the most successful example of multiracial sport in the country by the late 1990s. Although an unintended consequence of Thatcherite economic policies, this significant decline in cricket participation was entirely predictable once similar policies were implemented within education. Simply put, Severe budget cuts led to the proportion of state educated pupils doing less than two hours of physical education a week, rising from 38% in 1987 to 71% by 1990. And yet, as bad as these figures were, it was the sale of more than 10,000 school playing fields by 1997 that has done the greatest damage. Indeed, participation rates were so low that Thatcher's successor, the avowed cricket lover John Major, sought to repair some of the damage with the creation of the National Lottery in 1994. This ultimately led to the abandonment of the Sports Council and, crucially, its philosophy of sport for all. A principle that had done much to provide opportunities for working class participation Major's sports minister, Ian Sprout's statement that the government was no longer interested in the promotion of, quote, mass participation, informal recreation and leisure pursuits, 
now meant government policy replicated the elitist culture of the MCC, the ECB and other governing bodies, most notably the Rugby Football Union. If the repercussions of this took many years to fully manifest themselves, this shift has led to the overrepresentation of privately educated athletes across a wide range of sporting activities. Given the selection of talent from such a narrow demographic, we should view cricket's current malaise with as a warning, because running a sport or anything else for that matter by and for a socially and culturally homogenous minority is unsustainable. Indeed, cricket now faces a demographic time bomb largely of its own making. Those who attend first-class matches in England today are now overwhelmingly white men, of whom 65%, based on their job description, would be considered upper or middle class. Worse still, their average age of 50 is much older than the global average age of 34. While it is clear that those who run, play and watch first-class cricket in England fail to reflect the cons constituency that sustained the game at the recreational level, and in terms of race this is key because now at least one-third of all recreational cricketers are South Asian, the underrepresentation of ethnic minority cricketers has deep-rooted causes. And where overt racism fails, structural barriers succeed, with large numbers of minority clubs being excluded from the recreational mainstream because of their, quote, poor facilities. The insistence upon good wickets and well-appointed pavilions is a significant repercussion of English cricket's carefully nurtured image as a rural game. Indeed, this image and its associated values may well be the game's own worst enemy. If the game's ill-defined, yet aloof, spirit isn't bad enough, the England team taking the field to the strains of Jerusalem can only restrict cricket's appeal further, for it reinforces the racially motivated monoculturalism at the heart of the Tebbit test. To conclude, therefore, I believe the cultural and structural changes we all wish to see will prove impossible unless the social makeup of those who run the game is fundamentally altered. But just as important is the reassessment of the game's orthodox history. The dissemination of a non-elitist and thus inclusive history of cricket is not impossible, but cricket's future as a sport with anything resembling broad popular appeal will remain in doubt unless the game better, better understands its own past and, crucially, begins to reflect the nation that is England today. Thanks very much. I will now hand over uh, to Dr Paul Ian Campbell, who will be talking about constructs of race in FIFA football video games. Thank you. Ryan, thanks, Duncan. Um, so, uh, only 10 minutes, so so let's begin. Um, as Duncan said, I'm going to be talking about constructions of race, particularly within the FIFA uh, football video game franchise. Okay, so um, various studies into sports commentary, including um, my own recent study at the World 2018 World Cup, find that black players are more likely to be praised for their strength and speed while white players conversely are praised in relation to their intellect, uh, uh, cognitive abilities and technique, even when they're performing the same activities on the pitch. So many of these kind of racial stereotypes in sport are traceable back to the kind of enlightenment and particularly to the pseudosciences that emerged in the 1800s and particularly to social Darwinism, which is one of the first coherent um, sciences to divide people into different race categories in the way that we might recognize them today. This typology held that kind of white European races were the most evolved in terms of their brain size and thus their cognitive abilities, intellect and character. And as a result, as a species, they evolved not to require um, the, the, the need for the physical prowess because of their intellect. Conversely, 
black races um, were, were considered to be the least evolved and halfway between a human and an animal. And they were framed as inherently violent, lazy in, and intellectually limited. And because they were seen to be closer to the animal kingdom than other races, it was concluded that they conversely needed greater physical strength to compensate their limited intellect. Okay, so these ideas facilitate the view that black people are inherently animalistic and more suited to physical activities rather than cognitive tasks. And it was also seen as making them actually natural athletes. Um, and these ideas maintained from the 1800s all the way through uh, into the kind of contemporary day. So um, quite recently, the ex-Crystal Palace chairman, when describing the ways in which different race players um, contribute to teams, he said that in multiracial teams, black players provide a lot of skill and flair and white players balance things up and give the team some brains. But how do these ideas or fantasies about race influence the digital worlds of video games, especially games on uh, football? OK, so um, so our case study. So myself and my colleague, Dr. Marcus Maloney, examined the FIFA 2020 game and it launched in 1990 or the FIFA franchise launched in 1993. And since then has sold over 260 million copies, making it the highest selling sports video game of all time. Its producers aim to make it a realistic simulation um, of of professional football. As such, gamers can play as any club across all the major football leagues and as their favorite players. A combination of state-of-the-art <clears throat> and individual attributes are, that are coded to match the abilities of real-world players enable users to simulate playing as or against their soccer idols. And through state-of-the-art technology and, and, and um, joypads, players can feel the difference of, of the different qualities and attributes each player in the game possess. So FIFA's popularity in its attempt to replicate the game and sporting attributes of real players make it the ideal case study for an examination of race, football and video gaming. Okay, so... <clears throat> I'm not gonna kind of bore you too much with the, the methodology, but actually the, the part of this uh, methodology is really, really crucial here. So how did we go about doing this? So in short, what we did was we analyzed FIFA's top 2100 outfield players and paid particularly in, uh, particular attention to the attributes and their attribute scores. So the ways in which each player, the ways in which this, um, the top 100 or all the players were is they all have these cards and on these cards their attributes are divided or their, their abilities are divided into six attributes and that's pace dribbling shooting defending passing and physicality and each attribute is given a score that relates to the player's ability so what we see here is manchester city's young forward phil foden and here is the ex-Tottenham midfielder uh, and Dombele. Now, anyone that's familiar with football will tell you, will know that Phil Foden is an extremely uh, quick footballer, and then Dombele is a technical player, but not particularly mobile. But when we look at the scores that they're given for each player, we see that Foden, despite being quicker, is given 75 for speed, while then Dombele is given a higher score for pace. So what I'm, I'm trying to indicate here is that these scores are not facts or reality, but representations. They are the coders um, uh, imaginings of real world footballers, different com different competencies. But these scores are important because they inform every aspect of the digital players game. So what we can see is out of the top 100, the aggregate scores for each of these competencies, when we divide them along lines of race between black and white, uh, sporting avatars. We see that for those um, attributes that are physically based and those that are intellectually based map quite neatly onto the natural athlete discourse. So we see, for example, for speed, overall black player score uh, significantly higher than white digital players. And same for physicality, whereas 
shooting and um, uh, sorry, whereas um, shooting and passing, which are um, techni technical based activities, we see aggregate scores of, of the white uh, digital players scoring more highly. Importantly, these um, subcategories of characteristics are further divided within the, the, the coding matrix. So for each of these attributes, the game subdivide these into further competencies, which we describe as specific sporting competencies. So not only are they subdivided, but each individual sporting, uh, specific sporting competency is given a numerical score and also allocated by the game a, a, a um, designated a particular um, attribute. So they would be described as either physical, mental, or technical. So we see, for example, with pace, acceleration is a physical attribute, speed is a physical attribute. When it comes to shooting, finishing is technical, long shots technical, and so forth, and passing, and so forth. So we can go down the list. To help us understand these, the game also provides descriptions for each attribute to help us understand exactly what each um, sporting competency relates to. So let's look at some of the statistical differences we found between the aggregate scores for black and white digital players within the game um, relating to these specific sporting competencies. So when we see within the pace category and the subdivision of acceleration and sprinting speed, we see again black uh, avatars win out. Same with um, physicality when we're talking about jumping, stamina and strength. Again, we see black players win out every single time. But interestingly, when it comes to technical based competencies, the reverse is true. We see that in terms of crossing, passing, uh, short pass, long pass, free kicks, curving the ball. In each case, white players um, win out in terms of the aggregate scores. So, what does all this mean? So we've seen our individual player attributes are coded in ways that clearly align with the natural athlete logic. This was significant as coding informs all the algorithms that determine how digital players move and importantly, how their AIs behave in the game and how gamers experience playing them. And we'll see this through two simple examples that I'll finish with. So we saw that black players, uh, digital players outperform white digital players in relation to balance and agility. And so the game's uh, descriptor explains that um, if a player, uh, if uh, the balance influences how responsive the individual player feels when you're playing them. Moreover, if the digital player has higher stats for agility and balance, then they will be able, they will have greater fluidity, and the gamer will be able to get out of tight spots. Conversely, white digital players are uh, who dominated technical based competencies such as free kick accuracy. These were explained as the higher the value, the better the accuracy of the free kick on goal. And the description itself concludes by advising the gamer to pick a free kick taker who has a good score for free kick accuracy and curve. So clearly all this has a profound influence on who or which digital race, uh, digital players games associate with certain sporting attributes and tasks. The game actually invites gamers to associate and pick certain race digital players for certain sporting objectives, such as running fast or passing. In this regard, playing FIFA 20 is actually playing race in action. Now, just to finish with, and this more on this more kind of profound point, through the technology within the joypad, such as user vibration, FIFA 20 provides an experience which takes place through the way each chosen player moves, how the gamer is able to control them, and how each player feels. In this way, FIFA 20, we argue, is a site for a potent but unconscious experiential socialization in racialized myths. Put simply, FIFA gamers unwittingly come to know race, not only through the usual channels of seeing race difference on screen, but through feeling the racialized difference of the computer coded natural athlete and quite literally through their controllers. Okay, well, thank you for listening. And I'm now going to pass on to 
Um, Professor Panicus Panayi. Now, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. So my talk is about the history of the foreign footballer in London in uh, 10 minutes. So we can begin with Walter Tull. Um, and what I'm going to do is sort of put these people in their, in their uh, time, if you like, and, and what they mean about uh, football in London and more particularly migration and racism in, in, in London of that time. So um, this is turn of the century, 20, 19th into 20th century uh, footballer Walter Tull. Um, and he played for Tottenham Hotspur as well as a, a variety of of other teams. He was a mixed race born in uh, in Britain, um, and he's probably more famous for the fact that he was a, a black officer uh, during the First World War in the British Army. Um, but I guess, in terms of wider perspective, what you know, he's a black person in Britain at a time when. Uh, black people were probably at their lowest numbers um, over the past two centuries. And in a sense, he does one thing which a lot of uh, black people in Britain did at, at this time, which was um, he's he's part of what, if you like, uh, the entertainment industry. Um, but um, so so and, and, you know, he is he is he is a, a sort of pioneer. I mean, I know there's other black uh, and Asian footballers around, but I mean, he you know, Walter Tull seems to be something of a of, of, a, of a particular icon um, above uh, many other uh, black and Asian footballers. So when we move on to um, Liam Brady, I think what he's uh, representing for me um, is the Irish in London. So um, for those of you who are unaware of the importance of um, the Irish in London, I mean, if I wanted to put it very uh, bluntly, I could say, um, that the Irish built London. Um, I mean, I know there were other groups who helped to build London, but if you looked at the history of London, the uh, construction industry from the 18th century until way, way, way into the 20th century, then the Irish um, were um, very important in this. And I think, you know, the broader point is that um, Irish migration um, helped to, to build London in all sorts of other ways. And, you know, the book I did about the migrant history of London, um, London is a very Irish city. Um, it's a very Jewish city. It's a very West Indian city. It's a very Cypriot city. Um, but, you know, if we stick with with um, Irish uh, for, for the moment. Um, so he, Liam Brady, who played for Arsenal in the 1970s and 1980s, um, was one of countless um, Irish footballers who moved especially uh, towards uh, Tottenham Hotspur, Hotspur um, and Arsenal. And Conor Curran, uh, who was supervised by my colleague uh, Matt Taylor, who I assume is in the audience, um, has written an absolutely fabulous book about um, about Irish footballers uh, in, in, in Britain rather than London. Um, and in, in a sense, for most of the post-war period, um, the Irish were the most important uh, migrant group um, in in London football and in British football, both from uh, the Republic of Ireland and from Northern Ireland. And they start disappearing, um, I guess, from the 1980s and 1980s when, when the Premier League um, is born and when uh, migrate, global migration of footballers takes off. Um, so I wanted to put Clyde Best um, up because um, I mean, again, I know there's football, there's black footballers between Walter Tull and and Clyde Best, but I I, I think Clyde Best is is some is a real uh, seminal figure, um, if you like, and and one of the reasons I'm putting him up is because I remember him from my childhood. Uh, so, and I got very excited when I saw uh, Clyde Best on TV, and I think the reason for this is because I went to um, a multicultural school in North London. Uh, where a lot of the pupils were either great Greek Cypriot or or West Indian, and I, I think I got really excited because um, I was seeing someone on TV who could play football uh, in the same way as my my school um, colleagues. Um, 
did, you know, my fellow pupils. But I think he's also really important because people of my age were probably, I mean, I, I was useless at football, but people of my age, including the person on the left, must have been inspired um, by, by watching Clyde Bess, who played for West Ham in the, in the late 1960s and early 1970s. He was born uh, in Bermuda. And I think, you know, obviously Ian Wright is a, you know, he's one of many uh, players who who make the breakthrough uh, in the late eight, 1980s uh, and and 1990s, and, and and you know before that in the, in, in the earlier 1980s. Um, and I think I picked Ian Wright partly because he's written two great uh, autobiographies about his um, about growing up uh, in South London. Um, and of course, he is one of the players who would have experienced the very uh, awful racism which I could see um, as a Chelsea supporter um, in in the 1980s and, and 1990s against one of the players um, well, well the first uh, Chelsea black player um, Paul Cannonville but Ian Wright is for people like Ian Wright I think you know people who become professional footballers love football but I mean the other thing is it's a it's a it's an avenue to social mobility um, and, you know, a lot of his contemporaries, um, I mean, I'm not going to roll them all off. Um, for them, um, football, um, you know, did offer that path. And, you know, in the book I did about the migrant history of London, I think it's absolutely fundamental to appreciate that migration and social mobility is a long term process. And, you know, there are uh, many Ian Wrights, obviously, there's many people who aren't uh, Ian Wrights, as you need to read Ellis Cashmore. Uh, for, for all that theory. So uh, John Barnes is a bit different. Um, and John Barnes, as he always tells us, um, and when I met him a few years ago when he came to the Montford, that's one of the only times I've ever felt I was in the presence of greatness. Um, and John Barnes, um, as he always tells us, is the, is the son of a Jamaican colonel. So he's not somebody's experience um, social mobility he always says um, he's privileged and I think there's probably you know putting these two people up together is quite important because um, you know for for second generation born in Britain um, black kids born in London black kids um, football offered a path to social mobility for John Barnes he was already there as he always um, tells us. Um, and he's the beginning maybe of what uh, a lot of um, foreign footballers become, unlike Liam Brady, unlike Ian Wright, um, elites, elites moving into an elite sport. And I think these two people uh, are part of the transition um, from, uh, you know, the, the social mobility to the entry of elites. Um, I mean, in a sense, Henri's is born into a fairly um, similar background to to Ian Wright, but when he enters Britain, he enters as a, sorry when he enters when he joins Arsenal, he enters as an elite player in the same way as Didier Drogba, who's actually born um, on the Ivory Coast and then goes to live with his uncle um, in in France. Um, but they're they're entering as elite, so it's you know the way in which demonstrating the way in which the foreign footballer changes. Uh, Gradually, I mean, obviously, all footballers are released, but so is the foreign footballer. And when we look at people like this, um, David Lewis and um, and Eden Hazard, I mean, they're they're elite spawn into elite backgrounds because, um, well, I mean, it depends whether you call their backgrounds elites. David Lewis is the son of um, uh, school teachers, so you know he's not the, the Diego Maradona type uh, footballer. Um, who who makes rapid social mobility? Eden Hazard is the son of two professional footballers, um, and I guess you know if you look at most of the, uh, and I think it goes back to some of the stuff that was said in the um, first um, presentation. If you look at a lot of um, footballers, uh, foreign footballers uh, for London teams and and British teams, um, you know they're on ridiculous sums of money. It reflects. Um, the, you know, if anything reflects social inequality in Britain, um, it's, for, it's football or, or in London, well, especially in London, um, it, it's football. Um, however, I would say um, that uh, all hope is not lost from the point of social mobility. Um, 
because uh, these two, so so if you deal with Callum Hudson Adoy, um, he does have a football background because his father was a football. But I mean, you know, he is again someone who's experienced um, social mobility. Bukayo Sako is completely normal um, from a social point of view because I think he's parents and I couldn't find out very much about his social background. Uh, probably if I was an Arsenal fan and read Arsenal programs, maybe I could. But um, as far as I could find out, he, he's, his parents just carry out normal working class uh, work and he's managed to make it as an, an elite footballer. Um, so maybe just to conclude, um, you know, the, the foreign footballer, unfortunately, is now more like um, Eden Hazard than Liam Brady or or, or Ian Wright. Um, but um, there still does seem to be space um, for um, people like um, Bukayo Sako. So um, that's all I have to say, and I'll hand over hand over to Dan, Dr. Daniel Kilvington. Hello, thank you uh, for having me and uh, great to know people are listening along to this as well. We've got 10 minutes speed lecture, so I will crack straight on my uh, 10 minute talk is exploring the worrying growth of online racism in football. Why is it happening and how do we stop it? So I'll be talking about some of the work that I'm doing in this area and some of the research behind it as well. So just to give a bit of an outline, we'll start by this uh, myth that was this racial utopia. Uh, the, the internet was perceived to be back in the day, back in the 1990s. And then we're going to look at the shifting nature of racism in football, moving from the terraces to online spaces, particularly uh, Twitter is, is one of the key areas and platforms for this as a micro blogging site, which is very reactionary. Then we're going to look at the motivations for this quickly. I'll draw on some uh, a theoretical framework that I've developed for understanding the reasons, drawing on Goffman's work from 1959 and updating that, and then looking at what we can do to challenge this. And um, yeah, and I think for those listening along, feel free to send in your questions if you've got any ideas around how we might challenge it or uh, anything in relation to what we're talking about in these presentations. So on the next slide, we see this this is a famous cartoon from the new yorker back in i think it was 1993 and it says here on the internet nobody knows you're a dog in other words you can be anybody online and it doesn't matter you can be from any background any culture any ethnicity any religion it doesn't matter because we are free it's this racial utopian i think as we fast forward 28 years or 30 years from this uh, we can see that this this is not the case. Uh, and it's quite clear that racism and sexism and other forms of discrimination and prejudice have been posted online in volumes that are unprecedented and that we've not seen uh, before. Um, so in terms of online racism in football, and it's quite clear that as the stats uh, have showed a decline and a decrease in uh, over active discrimination within football stadiums and around football stadiums, uh, as we can see by this first uh, quotation at the top there, we see the statistics moving in the opposite direction. There's a sharp increase in online racism and other forms of discrimination um, across social media um, within a football context. So as we see that, while just 14 fans were arrested for racist chanting in English football stadiums between in the 18-19 season, uh, there were actually over 134,000. It was actually 134,400 discriminatory social media posts that were uh, made across social media platforms in the 14-15 season, just within the context of the Premier League. So that's attacking players and clubs as well. Uh, also, in 2016, there was uh, research done also by Kick It Out, which was that there was 22,000 discriminatory online posts directed at players and teams during the Euros in 2016. Yet recently as well, so just in the last couple of years, Football Against Racism in Europe, they found that there were 157 players involved in Champions and Europa League uh, final eight tournaments, and they received discriminatory abuse on Twitter. So that's just on Twitter, not looking at other social plat social media platforms as well. Also, in the last two years as well, the PFA, they've started to actually do some research into this and they've quantified it that 
there was 43% of Premier League players that were involved in their study had experienced explicit racist abuse at them online. Um, and again, the final one shows that there was a 48% increase in unmoderated racist abuse um, in the second half of the 2021 season, with 50% of abusive accounts coming from the UK. So it's quite clear that there's a, a major problem within the game at the moment, and it's getting worse rather than getting better. So what causes um, online hate speech? What are the motivational factors? So within my research, I've kind of narrowed it down to, to four things. I've read ar around the psychology of racist abuse and why that happens in discrimination. And there's these four things that kind of really do apply to online spaces. The first one is anonymity. So we can be anonymous in the real world, in the, in the so-called physical world outside. outside. Uh, we could wear a hood or we could, we could wear a mask. That, that could be done. But online, it's much, much easier. And we wear different masks on different platforms. We can set up fake profiles as well. And linked to that, we've also got invisibility. And what we mean by invisibility is the idea that you are physically disconnected. You are geographically displaced from uh, the person that you are abusing, that you are sending uh, discrimination to. You can't look that person in the eye. And that is very much why we have psychologists and therapists who have the, the couch facing away. So it's that eye, eye contact is not there. And when we don't have that eye contact and we're not looking at that person in the eye, we become more honest and that leads to a level of disinhibition. We've also got the idea that it's just a game, uh, which is known as disassociative imagination. And that's a separate sphere. So online, different rules apply. It's a free for all. You can say what you like and then you click away to that black mirror and then you're back in the real world. But it's not as simple as that. What about the impact that that is having on the victim in terms of mental health and well-being? The way that they're experiencing that. What about their family and their friends who know that they're experiencing that? People like Raheem Sterling, who face an awful lot of amount, uh, awfully high amount of online abuse and online racism. What impact is that having on them? but also their wider networks and family. The final one is looking at instantaneous communication. So Twitter is a micro blogging platform, really. It's about being first out there. It's about knee jerk reactions. It's about rapid response. But the quicker we are to respond to something with a knee jerk reaction, the more likely we are to say something that we may later regret. And also we're unaware of the audience that we're reaching. And research was done that actually on Facebook um, users actually reach audiences three times the size of what they actually perceive that it might actually be. Okay, so a theory that I developed uh, and worked on to help us understand why this is happening online is to draw on the work of Irving Goffman. And Irving Goffman in 1959 published the book, The Presentation of the Self in Everyday Life. He said we have front stage spaces and backstage spaces. Now, I don't think that that theory translates as easy to online spaces because now we have virtual front stages, which is our Facebook wall or Twitter uh, wall, and we have the virtual backstages, which is closed communication. But the one thing that happens online, which doesn't happen offline, is those stages are blurred online because of how we communicate and compose those messages. So we compose these messages behind our phone, behind that black mirror, and we type that out. And that's a very private, hidden, secret space. And what we're seeing now is we're seeing social media has allowed these backstage ideas and private thoughts and private comments and communication to be aired in virtual front stage spaces. And that's one of the reasons why we're seeing over 134,000 discriminatory reports being uploaded online across social network sites, um, which is very, very worrying. So in terms of the stakeholder response then, what is happening? What is football doing? So in 2015, 2016, I started actually interviewing football's key stakeholders to find out what they were doing to combat against this. And uh, myself and my colleague, John Price, we found that there was a lack of communication, there was a lack of guidelines and policies um, and action that existed across uh, the stakeholders. They were working in silo, they wasn't collaborating and also one of the key findings we found was the FA wouldn't actually liaise with Kick It Out to discuss social media cases. They would, on, uh, they would in stadiums, but they wouldn't online. So it looked like a lot of stakeholders were caught off guard by this. Also, 
Kick It Out, they established the Click It Out campaign in 2015. The PFA did the Enough campaign um, in 2019. Manchester and other clubs have actually started working direct with uh, social media platforms. And uh, as of last year, so almost a year ago now, we had the boycott, so the uh, the four-day boycott, which I have been critical of. I think it's good to show that unification, but the problematic way by doing nothing and being silent is being placid and part of the problem. We've got to speak out and use those four, four days of rather than silence, let's educate, let's change things, let's do something proactive rather than just staying silent. Because what happened afterwards, Signify found that straight after there was a spike by the end of that month. Okay, so just as I'm getting to wrap up, there's various recommendations for reform that I've put forward in my work, such as mandatory annual social media training for those within football. Uh, and linked to that is services available around wellbeing counselling for players and victims who are who are actually being attacked online on a daily basis. We also need clear and streamlined reporting for people out there online who spot this and identify this and then can report quickly. We need to ensure that stakeholders are proactive rather than reactive. This also needs a lot of investment and resources. And one of the key things as well is trying to build social media uh, organizations and relationships with those in the game. Okay, and uh, these are um, organizations that are currently working with in terms of tackling this right now. So working with FAIR and also on their AHRC grant called Tackling Online Hate Football. And that is a speed lecture over uh, from me. Thank you very much for listening. Hope you've got some questions at the end, which I'll be able to answer. And up next is Chris Elsie and the team. Thank you very much. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry. Good afternoon. Thank you, Daniel. That's fabulous. So um, the topic of this short lecture is racism and mental health um, in professional sport. And for I'd like Again, I'd like to acknowledge the um, research work done by my collaborators, Sue Nasreed and Alicia, who've done important background work on the cases that I'm going to talk through today. Okay, so the first thing I guess to note is that we're coming at um, this topic from a different angle to some of the sort of previous presenters, I think, and that pretty much stems from the nature of the research project that we're working on, which is around mental health disclosure narratives in professional sport. And therefore, the cases I'm going to present today came to us and we became aware of them due to the sort of mental health aspect of it in the first instance. And what we're going to focus on is players' experiences in their own words. And one of the things that we began to notice as a team when we were looking into sort of some of the instances of racism in sport, particularly in the media reporting, was that often the focus was on the sort of discriminatory and sort of abusive nature of the actions. So there's the reports of the, sort of the racism, whether it's names, noises, images, and so forth. And what we as a team began to look at was to think about how that related to players' mental health and their sort of well-being. And we felt that sort of the players' sort of welfare and well-being were overlooked in much sort of media discourse. And I think neatly, sort of um, Daniel just sort of mentioned sort of this aspect as being important moving forward. And one of the things that we sort of began to notice when we were looking at these cases was that often there would be what you might see as one-off incidents of sort of racism um, in various sporting contexts. However, and like following on from Daniel again, is that what we began to see is that this, even if it, these incidents were one-off, they sort of began to spiral because the media and social media recycled the abuse and intensified it, made it more significant and led to massive impact on players' mental health as a result. So what do we mean by this? Let's have a look at sort of what we'd see as a fairly, hopefully clear example. This is Rene Hector. Um, at the time, she was a Tottenham women's footballer, um, and this is her story. And again, we came at it originally from it being a case of um, depression. But when we look, listen to her account, um, we'll begin to see um, the other things that these sort of things that were going on. We went forward for a corner. We had a corner, um, and our captain's job at the time was to try and 
block a player so I could get round the back po- back post free, um, and obviously try and try and head it in. Um, and sort of we were successful in doing that. And as I made a run round the back post, I heard like monkey noises as I jumped to try and connect with the ball. I was so in shock. I thought, did I just hear that right? And then I could hear my teammate complain. Okay, so this is the original incident. Um, and all fairly transparent, it was heard and understood by all of those on the field as an incident of racism. So let, let's listen then to as she carries on and the follow up questions here. Situation. How did people react to that once you'd put the word out there that this had happened to you? They were mostly messages of support, but the, the real abuse started probably when um, sort of the news articles got a hold of it and they put up um, quite unflattering pictures of me. Um, and then there was a lot of abuse based on like my appearance, uh, uh, some more racist abuse as well online. And, and that was pretty difficult to deal with. And how deeply did this affect you? Really deeply, I think. Um, obviously, it didn't just affect me. It affected my family at home as well. I was just sort of spiralling, um, sort of out of control, like just basically just started seeping into the to depression, really, situation. How did people uh, react to that? Okay, sorry. Okay, so I just want to point out a couple of things from this. Hopefully, it's sort of fairly apparent. And the one thing that we begin to notice is that the way that she talks about the abuse, how she really felt in terms of the mental health, she refers to the online abuse that happened after it was picked up in the media. The online abuse was the real abuse. And it was that sort of cycle, and sort of, as I said, in a way that it was recycled. And of course, here, again, you sort of begin to see in terms of the mental health, you just see her describing it as a spiral. You see her describing it as a sort of seeping and, and how she fell into depression. But please note, she didn't have mental health issues sort of previous to this. And it, so you can see sort of the way in which the narrative and the way it sort of came from an on-field incident. Okay, so this brings us to sort of the second example that we wanted to talk through. And this is, I guess, more familiar um, and obviously has been a, a lot more picked up upon. And we're going to come at it from a slightly different angle. Again, remembering that um, for us, the, the interest was always in the beginning to sort of the mental health aspects of some of these stories. So Azim Rafiq, as we all know, hopefully. So I just want to go back to a particular point in time, when, in, which is sort of 2018. Okay. Um, and what happened that year? So in May 2018, Rafiq, um, who was either in a, involved in a match or a training match, received a phone call to get to the hospital urgently. And when he got there, he was informed that, unfortunately and sadly, his son had died and had been stillborn. And this clearly and obviously resulted in sort of sort of him sort of spiralling and him sort of falling into sort of um, sort of poor mental health and you know just you know gr- gr- grieving for a long period and what happened as a result of that because you've got to remember that may is the beginning sort of early in the cricketing season is that he pretty much missed the entire year he played a few games in july and therefore when it came to um september the end of the season his contract was up and yorkshire decided not to renew his contract now there's a key thing to remember here this happened in 2018. It wasn't until 2020, September, two years later, that he made the allegations formally about institutional racism against Yorkshire. So that's a long period of time. That's why when we came across the story, I just became aware of the sort of the loss of his son. And that's how I came at the story. Now, what led to him coming out and sort of talking about his experiences? Basically, in August of 2020, he gave three interviews. And what you see is that these three interviews, they developed and like what he focused on and talked about developed. In the first one, the Wisdom interview, he talked mostly about his grieving, the stillborn son and the loss and the way in which he had did sort of that, that experience of taking your son from the hospital straight to a cemetery and stuff like that and there were a few sort of mentions of racist um conduct and stuff but they were just sort of passing 
in the second interview of the Cricket Badger podcast, a similar kind of thing. Again, the focus on grieving. And he also opened up a bit more about sort of how he was sort of on the edge and sort of had considered suicide and these kind of things as well. So again, the focus on those experiences. But as the interview went on, it's quite a long one, sort of institutional racism and instances of racism, different kinds began to sort of come out. And then the final interview was very much more for sort of focused on those things. And ultimately led to this kind of idea that he says that Yorkshire had promised him that they would look after him professionally and personally. And clearly they didn't. So what happened? As we all know, Yorkshire then did an investigation. And here is, we're gonna just pick out a few things from the report that they conducted. So began September, 2020, published in 21, but pretty much a year later. Now, they upheld a lot of um, his criticisms about sort of how they'd sort of mistreated him in terms of his religious beliefs, racism, bullying, and so on. Now, the first thing to know about the sort of the, the, the summary and the outcome of this is that the report reveals, and astonishingly, that Yorkshire, as a, an employer, doesn't run or didn't run equality and diversity training. It just doesn't run it. So you can kind of get the sense of them as an organisation. Then they had the temerity in, in, in this report to claim that he was released for cricketing reasons, as if you can separate out all of those other things. It doesn't even acknowledge the fact that, of course, his performance that year was terrible because he'd lost a son. It doesn't reflect that, doesn't understand that, doesn't acknowledge all of those other things. Looking after him personally, no sense of that. Now, let's let's look at the report. Um, this is even worse. So the report reveals that actually, let's go back to 2018, August and then September, Rafiq made two allegations at that time of racist and bullying behaviour. One of those in the meetings when he was told he was leaving. However, these allegations in 2018 were never recorded, nor were they investigated. Hideous. And it's kind of a key thing about, you know, sort of that. So finally, let's have try and end with a positive note, I think, because we need to think about this. With Ramadan approaching, I think it, what's key is to think about, say, you know, following the Rafiq case, thinking about how sort of Islamic practice fits into the world of professional sport. And the exa example of players being allowed to break their fast to consume liquid and um, nutrition and stuff like that and energy during matches because referees and all of the teams agreed upon it shows a great example of how we can go about making change and uh, helping accommodate um, people and so on. So fabulous. Um, thank you so much. So we're now going to move on to um, final presentation with Dr. David D. So uh, we look forward to hearing what you've got to say. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, and and welcome to my to my talk. Um, anyone with an interest in, in boxing will probably believe it to be a sport in which immigrants and minorities have been especially present and successful. Uh, this is especially the case in the United States, where several historians have probed the deep uh, historical connections of multiple communities to boxing. But boxing is a similarly ethnic sport in Britain. Um, my research has shown me that at least 41% of all British world champions have been first, second or third generation immigrants. And it's the case that fighters from all over the world have been based in Britain. There's been a long held belief in boxing in Britain that the sport is open to all, a meritocratic route to acceptance, acclaim and financial reward with seemingly no consideration of ethnic group or skin colour. But this simply isn't true. Many within and around the world of British boxing might understand it to be an apparently colour blind sport, but immigrants and minorities have faced racism and discrimination from the very earliest days. So we're going to try and highlight this idea that's developed around boxing in Britain as being colourblind, oblivious and unconcerned by the heritage and identity of its participants. But I also want to show why this idea is, is inaccurate and at odds to the historical reality and experiences of the vast majority of immigrant and minority boxers. 
But first, this idea of colour blindness. Um, because of the large minority participation, very obvious participation within boxing, it's often seen as, a, as an open and meritocratic sport. The idea of it being colour blind, you know, re, uh, viewing race, religion and or ethnicity as unimportant has become embedded into its history, its internal dynamic and self view. One historian has noted that the fight game at all levels prides itself on its apparent colour blindness. How else, many wondered, could boxers like Daniel Mendoza, Frank Bruno or Amir Khan, all pictured here, who were all born to immigrant parents in working class neighbourhoods, rise to the very top of the sport in Britain, develop and enjoy wealth and acclaim that astounded their parents and their communities and also be seen as national icons? Indeed, all three, one Jewish boxer, one black boxer, one Muslim boxer, were seen during the height of their successes in the 1790s, 1990s and 2000s, respectively, as apparent proof of the notion that all that truly mattered in boxing was skill and commitment. Similar sentiments have applied to immigrant boxers as well, like Hogan Bassey, pictured at the bottom, who moved from his native Nigeria in the early 1950s to further his career in the UK, before becoming world featherweight champion later in the decade. Now in Liverpool, where Bassey settled, married and called his second home, he was celebrated as a local hero. His success in the ring dominating the local news and community attention. Wider society and wider, the wider press has often interpreted this, these and other very prominent successes as evidence of the sport's tolerance of minority groups. Indeed, as the sports writer of the Daily Mirror in 1957 noted, to most of us who crowd the ringsides of the world, it's a matter of supreme indifference what the colour of a man's skin is, whether he's a Christian or a Jew, a Muslim or a Buddhist, atheistic or agnostic. The first thing we want to know is, is he a good practitioner of his art? And if he is a good sportsman too, well, bless your beautiful hide and damn its colour. Now, this notion of colour blindness has, has been present within the world of British boxing. For one, the belief in the openness of the sport um, has also been extolled by boxers themselves, even some of immigrant background. In 1973, Des Morrison became British super lightweight champion after beating uh, Joe Tete, who was originally born in Ghana in the first British title fight contested by individuals born outside of the UK. Born in Jamaica in 1950 and arriving in Bedford 10 years later, Morrison claimed, I think Joe and I made the point that boxing is one sport where colour is irrelevant. If you're good enough, you'll make it in the end, whatever your colour. In his review of the fight in the following week's Boxing News newspaper, the editor, uh, Graham Houston, added, I know I'm not alone in believing that skin colour is secondary if a fighter has the ability, heart and a pleasing way of boxing. Indeed, this is also a theme that's cropped up, as that shows, multiple times in the British boxing press. In 1995, for example, after the uh, success of Frank Bruno in winning the World Heavyweight crown or one of the World Heavyweight titles, the idea of colour blindness in the sport was again prominently evoked. The then editor of Boxing News, Harry Mullen, claimed that integration in the ring is absolute and Frank Bruno was not Frank Bruno, black boxer, just Frank Bruno, boxer. Clearly, many have concluded that boxing is an innately open sport, peculiar perhaps compared to others for being unconcerned by the identities and heritages of its participants. The sport in Britain has long looked like a welcoming world and atmosphere to individuals who would have otherwise struggled for acclaim and acceptance in wider British society. But the plain truth is different, and that is that the enduring situation for minority boxers has been an extremely difficult one. They've suffered from wider discriminatory attitudes seeping into the sport, and also the plainly racist attitudes of boxing's authorities and internal environment at many junctures of its history. It's simply too easy and too comfortable to hold a view of boxing in Britain in which ethnicity apparently doesn't matter. This probably explains why the racism that was written into the sports rules in Britain for a large part of the 20th century is only recently starting to be better understood. For instance, between 1911 and 1948, 
black boxers were forbidden from fighting for the British title. This rule originated in 1911 when a proposed contest between uh, the American black boxer Jack Johnson and the British white boxer Billy Wells for the world heavyweight crown was blocked by the Home Office in Britain for its apparent potential to fan racial unrest in Britain and its empire. Now, successive governments insisted that boxing could set its own rules, but the authorities within the sport interpreted 1911 and the Home Office's decision as meaning that effectively any black versus white major fight could be ruled illegal. This led to the rule that boxers had to be British born of two white parents to be eligible for contenders. There was a significant wider media and public pressure to drop the so-called colour bar, but the board remained steadfast until po political and public pressure forced them to change the rule after World War II, due partly due to uh, government pressure, but also wider public pressure, especially uh, focusing on the idea of black sacrifice to the British and Empire cause in the Second World War. Even after the colour bar was dropped, however, the sports rules regarding boxers, residency clauses and British titles remain significantly out of kilter with British law. Now, whilst boxing's authorities have discriminated against these groups, hostility has been commonplace across the sports history in Britain more generally. In Daniel Mendoza's time, stereotypical notions of Jewish cunning and hidden hands were widespread to explain away his triumphs. Whereas when black boxers first started to achieve international success in the early 20th century, it was explained, to use the words of the boxing writer for the Daily Express in the 1920s, by them being a blend of animal and human beings. It's been said of Britain's small hall boxing culture that ethnic, religious and racial tensions could often make the atmosphere ugly. Anti-Semitism was never far away when critical comment was passed on Jewish boxing entrepreneurs. And at a time when Commonwealth boxers effectively kept boxing in Britain alive in the 1950s, due to their willingness to fight for low purses or as substitutes, British writers like Tony Horsted were calling for caps to be introduced to save the sport for the white Britain. I could go on to talk about the often violent opposition to minority boxers and their fans from the British far right, the instances where Jewish and black boxers were banned from hotels or guest houses in the, in the cities they were due to fight in, about the exploitation of minority boxers, or indeed how racism in the street, at school or in youth clubs actually forced many to take up boxing in the first place due to an apparent need for self-protection. The point is a key one, though. Whatever narrative about British boxing that's been previously presented, it's been anything but racism free or colorblind. Those that have seen achievement in the sport have so often found it tainted, transitory or driven by some underlying agenda that served a wider rather than their own interests. So to conclude, throughout boxing's long history in Britain, there's been significant immigrant and minority involvement and a diverse range of individuals and ethnic groups have apparently been accepted into the boxing community in Britain. Immigrants have provided a large amount of the so-called bodily capital on which the sport functions, and immigrant labour effectively kept professional boxing afloat, as I said, at several points in its history. But to say that the sport is somehow special in terms of its attitudes towards immigrant and minority participants is simply untrue. It's relatively easy to locate and identify racist attitudes and assumptions that have hampered many individuals involved in the sport in an amateur and a professional basis, inside the ring, outside of the ring and in the wider business of the sport. In effect, and final comment, where immigrants and minorities have succeeded or come to prominence in boxing in Britain, this has more often than not been in spite of the sport's character and attitudes, not because of it. Thank you very much.
I want to say thank you so much to the various speakers that we have talking about racism in sport. I think there were just a lot of really interest, a lot of really interesting information. And I think there was also interlinks between the various lectures as well. I have a few questions for each of the speakers and then we have some general ones. So let me first probably start with a general question. Um, what opportunities do ethnic minorities have to kind of speak out about racism in sport that they are experiencing, considering the danger that it poses to maybe their career in the public, in the media, um, because it's not, I think to a certain degree, it's not really received very well if it's something that they're constantly talking about or constantly highly lighting, as we've seen with Raheem Sterling. That's open to anybody. Who did the football? <laughs> <laughs> I can kick us off to use a football fun. Um, I, I guess that my research actually uh, a few years back um, on social media, and I spoke with various clubs and player liaison and officers and agents, and it was found that players didn't really want to make those complaints, want to speak out because they thought it might jeopardise their position. They might be seen as playing the so-called race card. And those stereotypes around black men of chip on your shoulder and those types of comments that people get when they speak out. But I think there has been a culture shift in the last few years. And I think we are seeing the likes of Colin Kaepernick and then Raheem Sterling in football and then <coughs> Raheem Rafiq speak out in cricket. And when we, once we get more trailblazers who speak out, it empowers others to follow in those footsteps. And the louder that voice becomes, the harder it is to silence that voice. So I think we are at a pivotal moment. I think things are changing for the better. Uh, but obviously, the things that everybody says is still a long way to go. And there is a long way to go. But with more people speaking out, being empowered to do so, and being listened to, I think that's a key thing, being listened to, and we will be moving in the right direction. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Paul. Yeah, so, so um, I, agree, I agree with Dan's uh, points uh, to an extent. So I still think the reality is for people of colour in any institution to speak out about racism is puts them in a vulnerable position. So it's easy for kind of Raheem Sterling, for example, to speak out or easier for Raheem Sterling to speak out about racism taking place in the game generally or externally. But we also see the kinds of pressures that they're under when we see something that happens within the club, such as the, the Bernard, Men, uh, Bernard Mendy um, episode with uh, Silva, where they posted the, the, the rather offensive tweet, uh, uh, tweet on Twitter. The other thing which also happens here is we're also speaking about kind of capital. So if you've got the right currency, you're secure. If you're a youth team player in that situation and you want to speak out about against somebody of power, so using the Manchester City example, everybody wagon circled. You have um, Pep Guardiola supporting the player. You have senior players supporting. And, you know, this is kind of football nature. This is kind of the ways in which football organisations and uh, uh, kind of respond to racism. But if you're a youth team player or if you're a player that wants to get on in the game or if you're a coach or if you're a player, again, if you, you, you may have the channels, there may be the kind of um, uh, claim that there are these kinds of, play, uh, these kinds of um, opportunities to, to kind of challenge. But the reality is for people of colour, very rarely does taking on their own institution, whether it's in sport, whether it's in academia, whether it's in politics, really work out that they come out um, unscathed from this or, or and often not having to leave, leave the, the post or position that they're in. I think that's, a, I agree with both of your points and something that I would probably add to that personally um, is that when players speak up, I think it's also on the understanding that they need to be excellent players. You can't then become a mediocre player or someone who isn't doing your job and then be speaking out about racism. Because it's like you only have that opportunity if you're someone who's playing at the, the higher echelons of football and within your team. And there's also that pressure of, well, speaking out and maybe I'm not doing so well or things are going on, it's not as accepted or, or allowed. 
Yeah, I'll just quickly jump add, add to that point. Great, great point you made there as well. And just it doesn't help when you've got a comment by like Solskjaer, who then said to Rashford, Rashford's feeding the 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 youth of today, which politicians should be doing, but Rashford's doing it. And then Solskjaer said maybe he should just concentrate on his football. So how, how I, do you know what I mean? It's crazy. It's definitely something that we saw with LeBron um in the NBA when they said shut up and dribble, and this kind of idea of the two worlds shouldn't collide, which I think is something that you really touched on, Chris, and this idea of, well, he was let go for cricketing reasons. Well, it's like, well, these other things play a factor into his cricketing, and we're not taking that into consideration as well. But also, if, if, if we're taking a lesson from Colin Kaepernick, when his contract ended, none of the NFL teams would pick him up. Mm -hmm. You know, he's he's better than some of the quarterbacks that are still in in the NFL right now. But no one would like they wouldn't even attend a training to see him running about and try out. But, you know, they said like it was it was an agreement. And I think there's a quite I guess that comes to the question that's in the chat there. Like all of the NFL owners had a sort of a tacit agreement. We're not touching this guy. We're not we're not employing this guy, you know, and I think I guess that that's a nice leap. So the question that's here. So let me lead to that question, just in case those watching don't know what it is. It's from Melanie Cross at De Montford University. And she says, how can impactful change to address racism, discrimination or hate occur when sport is run and governed by largely white men and where discourses of meritocracy are dominant, accepted or go unchallenged? Hmm. I think that's obviously something that I talked about in terms of cricket, the ECB unfortunately is the same as any other institution in this country it is incapable of reforming itself uh, but i can't see this government or any other uh, intervening uh, as i said before cricket has never been run in the interests of the general public it's been run by and in the image of white middle class men which is why the game is struggling in terms of popular appeal today uh, but i also wanted to what, what in terms of the previous discussion and, and what Dan was talking about, uh, I think uh, the difference between the Professional Footballers Association and the Professional Cricketers Association is needs to be highlighted because uh, the relationship that uh, the Professional Cricketers Association, the trade union for professional cricketers, has with the ECB is very dubious indeed, seeing as it's part funded by the ECB, I believe. Uh, and historically, there are plenty of incidents, most notably uh, Devon Malcolm uh, and Phil De Freitas, uh, two black uh, England players uh, who were taken to task in an article in the Cricketer magazine. The Professional Cricketers Association told them that any attempt to sue the Cricketer magazine for defamation, racial abu abuse, would be unsuccessful. And it was actually the Professional Footballers Association that helped them uh, win their case. So in terms of actually who do you go to? Uh, I think there's still uh, big problems with that. And the fact that cricket in particular or the NFL uh, is run by effectively white, middle-aged, middle-class men, um, that is a problem. I would probably, let me try and lead then onto a question specifically for you, Duncan, and the research that you sure. um, gave. Well no, hopefully it's not going to be that difficult. <laughs> but I find it very interesting because I'm from Black Caribbean background and cricket was a major interest in my household and it still is. And watching it, I, you know, it's not my favourite sport, but it is a big thing because of like my dad grew up in Jamaica. So yeah. when you talk about I guess specifically within the United Kingdom, within this context, that it's really a homogenous group who are being represented on the UK team. Do sporting um, organisations really care that it's going to die or that this is going to be something that is no longer going to be prominent in the country? Because I would think because of the, the money that might be coming in from it, the international prestige, that this will be something that they'll be trying to diversify in. You would have thought so, but no. The evidence from the period I talk about in the sort of the first half of the book, uh, the gentleman amateur period, uh, is that, and I quote their own words, the evidence very strongly suggests they deliberately made the game less popular in order to preserve their social and cultural capital, you know, their position. 
Uh, and I, again, the evidence would suggest that although the, you know, the blazers have been replaced by suits um, and a more business orientated approach, uh, if you look at the development of Lords, for instance, it's not about getting as many people as possible in, it's about getting the right sort of people in. So they've spent 200 million pounds redeveloping Lords. How many more seats do you think there are? Go on, have a guess. 2,000. 4,000. 4,000. Okay. Uh, so they spent over uh, 25 million on the Warner stand and they increased the seats by 100. And some of those even had restricted views. They're not interested in making it a people's game. And that's that's and that's where the class issue i think overrides the racial one obviously these are two sides of the same coin but as mm -hmm. far as cricket is concerned it, it, it's sort of elitism first and then as awful as the azim rafiq evidence was and maybe people are arguing eh, specific to yorkshire there is there is it's elitism in the ecb that is their primary concern they just want to be surrounded by other white faces but they're not white faces for the sake of it they're rather white middle class faces so it's it's working class or people from a lower socioeconomic standing generally that are being excluded from cricket but it yeah. is in terms of the under representation of south asian uh, cricketers in particular bearing yeah. in mind in places like birmingham they make up almost two-thirds of players recreational players there is clearly <laughs> something stopping these players getting through or staying in the professional game but okay. going back they don't they are prepared to kill the game i believe okay wow that's a very yeah unfortunate reality i think we've lost um Dr. David Lee, so I want to thank him for his contribution. I'm going to try and get through the questions that we have for the individual speakers, and we're going, we've only got about five, seven minutes left, so we're going to have to go through them pretty quickly. My next questions were for Paul. How aware are coders of the racial implications that they are putting into games, and do we see this coding going on in other games outside of football or other um, gaming Game, other gaming. Sorry, so could you just repeat that first part of that question again? Sure. Please? So you were talking about the coders are the ones who are kind of putting in these racial implications. How aware of that of that are they? Is it conscious? Is it unconscious? Um, well, and the second question was, do we see this kind of racial determine, determining going into other gaming? Okay, so, so to answer the second question first, yes. So if we were to look at... Um, Sports games, particularly basketball, um, uh, EA, EA Sports Basketball, we, we see kinds of these kinds of um, tropes or patterns ma manifesting. But also if we look at kinds of various games, whether they be coin-ops, arcade games in the 90s through to more recent, we see kind of um, over uh, imagery of, of kind of strength and brutism for, for people of colour. We see overtly genderized and, and, and um, problematic presentations of, of, of women. In terms of conscious and unconscious bias, I, I, think that's, I think that's a debate in itself. But what we do know is that the coders don't exist in a social vacuum. They're, they're products of the environment in which they are reared and which they they kind of uh, are socialized. So, you know, this isn't something that you don't have these perceptions of footballers growing up and watching them and being interested in the game and then leave those perceptions on the kitchen table when you go into work. You take those with you. So ultimately, they what, what they see and what they code is influenced by their, their kinds of... Um, the things that they learn and the narratives that they buy into and, and shape their their beings um, and, and existence to that point. They're just a kind of representation of that uh, white cultural imagination. Okay. Thank you. And that does make sense. I wanted to move on to Panacos. So 
How do you specifically define the, define the word foreign in your research? Because I think in your presentation, we sort of moved from foreign, from what I could tell, and please correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong here, being one of like race and nationality to now in more recent times being one of nationality. Uh, well, it's basically first or generation immigrants. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're born in, so if you're a migrant, then, um, you know, that that's, you know, I'm obviously playing on the term. <laughs> so, you know, you're, you're like, you know, <laughs> one of the best books about the history of immigration in Britain, which isn't written by me, is called Bloody Foreigners. So, you know, I'm, I'm obviously, uh, you know, playing with the term. So it's either uh, somebody like, you know, Didier Drogba or Clyde Best, uh, or it's, you know, Ian Wright um, and, you know, Bukayo Sacco, uh, Callum Hudson Adoy. So, you know, that that's what what the term means. And and okay. in the book, in the book I wrote migrant city you know the the boundaries were first and second generation immigrants okay because i really wondered at that because as we talk about footballers like saka marcus rashford um now we're looking at people who technically might not be foreigners in this in the sense of yeah, that they might have been born here or they might be first or second generation but i wonder if they feel any more at home or part of oh, or still are seeing themselves as really quote unquote foreigners because of the treatment they're experiencing on one level, um, and on two, the fact of that acceptance that is on an equilibrium of whether they're doing well or meeting their goals and their targets, or whether they're not, and how dependent that is. But I don't know if we have time to go into that, but I found that very interesting. Thank you. I want to get through the rest of the questions. So Dan, one of the questions that we have is, why does there seem to be an overrepresentation in UK um, online racist abuse? I know you said that was for the year 2020 to 2021, but I mean, I'm not surprised by that, but what has your study shown about why we are overrepresented in this country? I don't think I've got an easy answer to that question, really. I think that... If you have a concise one, that'd be good. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll try my best. What I will say is, um, I believe I read somewhere that uh, of the top 10 hate accounts who were peddling far-right rhetoric uh, and abuse, six of those 10 were from the UK. So it's clear that we have a real problem when it comes to discrimination, racism within the UK. And the answer I can probably give very quickly would be that because it's the English Premier League, we've got a big audience, which is a domestic mm -hmm. audience, and maybe that's why that's the case. But there's probably a longer answer I could give given more time. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry it couldn't be as in-depth as you wanted. I'm going to move on to our last question for you, Chris, and then we're going to wrap up. Um, I felt like they were linked between what you were saying and your research um, to you and the team, and also something that was mentioned in the idea of the FIFA gaming. Um, this idea of, and correct me if I'm wrong, but boxing is probably a much more physical sport than a lot of others it's a much bigger contact sport than some other sports are how much do you think the idea of um concepts of race or i guess eugenics really play into the acceptance of black players in boxing because it is a more physical sport is it more accepted for black players to become boxers or to climb the ranks of boxing because it's like well they're more physical they're more they're more they're more violent these kind of racial um prejudicial thoughts that are out there has that factored into your because that's what I think about when I think about so many black black um boxers because well it's a more violent sport and black people are seen as stereotypically and incorrectly more violent um I can't speak to boxing um, okay. um but a lot of the cases we've looked at have involved American football and there, there's there is there is quite clearly a racial divide um, <coughs> in American football in that it's predominantly played by um, black men. But all the skilled positions, particularly quarterbacks and stuff like that, are generally white um, players and so on. Um, but if we're talking sort of institutional racism, it follows through that actually those players that are trying to get concussion settlements at the moment 
black players have a, a lot harder job of getting the payouts because it, there's an inbuilt um, sort of racial coding in the way in which um, yes. intelligence tests and um, cognitive ability is um, is measured. And I think that's built into it. And like they just get into legal disputes and like it's just, you know, family struggle and so on. It's, it, so it's built into the science and the medicine as well. It's, it's not s simply a, um, a presentational matter. Okay, thank you so much. I know you had to kind of answer a little bit on Duncan's no. there, no. but thank you for doing that. I just want to say thank you so much to all of our speakers who have come and presented on race and sport today. It's been very interesting, very informative. I thank you for taking the time out. And this was also another presentation in our anti-racism series. We have another one coming up in April 11th, which will be Christianity and Blackness and looking at the roots of Christianity um, and how people usually think of it as a white man's or a European religion and looking at actually what are the roots of Christianity and how do we see those roots within the continent of Africa. So please go and look at that on the DMU events website. But again, I want to thank you to our speakers and thank you for joining us today. Thank you.